creator of a concept called the Imagination Age. And the Imagination Age is a way to frame these fleeting decades that we're in between the longer industrial era and the coming intelligence era. So when I was young, I saw a documentary called Koyaanisqatsi. And in that documentary, humans are depicted in this ever-increasing, fast-paced world. Um, and it, it just gets so chaotic that you can no longer distinguish people are coming or going. And so I thought it would be helpful in all the chaos of the period we live in as our old systems crumble to frame these decades from a design perspective so that we can think about our systems, uh, education and work, our, our cultural systems and our economic systems. And so it's called the Imagination Age. However, I cannot take full credit for the Imagination Age. It was the idea of a child, and I used to spend a lot of time with her. And she told me one day that I was the only adult she ever met that made her feel that her imagination did not have to die when she became a grown-up. And I have to tell you, my heart snapped in two when I heard this. My imagination has always been the most important thing to me. Um, it's the way I, it's the prism through which I see the world, and I don't view the imagination as something frivolous, uh, although I do like to lay around in a hammock daydreaming a lot, but it's not just about that. It's about collaborating together and rapidly prototyping ideas so that you can work with other people in globally dispersed teams increasingly and determine what will work and what will not work before massive amounts of funding go toward funding prototypes that may not work. So redesigning systems is an extremely complex endeavor. It is so hard to understand how all these pieces fit together, particularly when you're talking about different cultural and economic systems, different perspectives all around the world. And so I knew that this was going to be a massive undertaking and that I needed to have a collaborator who had a very strong perspective on global culture. It was at this point that I met Joshua Fouts, and at the time he was running a think tank, a foreign policy think tank, and he was one of the only other people at the time, this was back in 2006, who understood the value of immersive virtual environments within the digital culture. So when most of us think about the internet, we think about websites, we think about Facebook, we think about Twitter, and these are extremely powerful platforms. However, there are also environments in which you can create an avatar and take that avatar and customize it any way that you'd like to. And so it presents an entirely new dilemma in the human mind. Uh, all of us are born at a specific place and time. We all know what socioeconomic bracket we belong to. We know how we're supposed to feel about that. We know our options are limited to change that. We know how we look. We know how we sound. Uh, we know who our parents are, and we know what they've passed along to us. And we know there's an expectation that it will be disappointing if we in some way either reject those ideas or develop crazy new ideas of our own. You run the risk of being ostracized. But what if you can create an entirely new identity for yourself, and it can consist of anything that you can imagine and create, and then you can interact with millions of other people globally in environments that you create much the same way that you created that avatar. So in other words, I could create a replica of this room and all of you could be avatars and my avatar could give a presentation to you. Do we need a ceiling in that room? Right now, the human brain is really only capable of change in a continuum. In other words, if you build a virtual environment right now, you're building it based on what you expect a space to be. Most people are more comfortable in avatars that look human, uh, for example. So Josh and I embarked on a project called Understanding Islam Through Virtual Worlds. Uh, we traveled through four continents in the physical world interviewing actual human beings. And at the same time, we interviewed people in 25 countries around the world in the form of their avatars in virtual environments. And it was a pretty mind-blowing exercise because um, for example, we would attend a virtual event called the Future of Religions, Religions of the Future. And we met a woman, a 21-year-old uh, woman from the United Arab Emirates who keeps a laptop hidden between her mattress and box spring and waits till everyone's at work and then goes into her other reality <clears throat> in which she has built an entire mosque community. So when you picture this mosque, uh, 
It is a gleaming gold fortress with amazing tile work, uh, you know, a, a body of water with boats bobbing in it. And the first time we went there, we were there with people from 13 other countries having a conversation in real time about legal issues in their own countries and how the local authorities deal with these. And it was absolutely fascinating to watch the way people interacted because you can speak in voice. There are real-time translations that allow people to uh, type in one language and have it appear in another language. You can have private chats. So we realized that much of cultural relations is based on a concept of respect, and rightly so, but that that concept of respect is often based on the notion that I respect who you happen to be born as in the physical world, which is very, very limiting. Kids today don't have that limitation because they are very comfortable existing in the physical world and at the same time in a hybrid reality composed of these digital communities. Call them games, call them virtual worlds, it really doesn't matter. It is a hybrid reality that kids fluidly move between. So then we started thinking, aren't these environments perfect for education? As our education system collapses under the weight of transformation and change, what if these environments could be used? So instead of teaching a kid, I mean, I'm sure you all remember uh, making dioramas in shoeboxes as kids, which I loved doing, but now imagine that shark you cut out on cardboard and taped to the back of a shoebox is an actual three-dimensional creature that you create from scratch, and you can create the habitat in which that creature exists based on research you do on your own or collaboratively. So after we finished understanding Islam through virtual worlds, uh, we embarked on a new project, which you see here. It's called Imagination, Creating the Future of Education and Work. And we spent two years in the United States and doing research about the global dynamic as well about education. And it is abysmal what is happening in the United States with regard to education. Um, the first thing that springs up into everyone's minds when we think about education is standardized tests. The fact of the matter is kids are still being taught that they are solitary in their educational process. There is no collaboration in this process. And so we looked until we found a group that was working with kids in a way we thought was the way that kids should be educated. So we went to the Cajun region of Louisiana to this building called Light. Um, it looks like a futuristic anomaly in the Cajun landscape. It's this $27 million immersive virtual facility, um, unlike any in the world that is not either belonging to the military or to private industry. So it's open to the public. And there was a game camp going on uh, for the kids. We got there on the first night, we stayed the whole week, and we worked with them. I believe that rolling up your sleeves and working with kids is the way to accomplish this shift. Um, and we see a lot of academic rhetoric about you know, how things need to change, but not a lot of people actually working with kids in these environments. So we decided that we would have to do that in order to understand how kids respond to it. So the first night, the kids were terrified. They showed up, they had never had any sort of experience like this in their entire lives. First of all, that they were learning in tandem. Secondly, they were terrified because they knew that at the end of the week, they had to present the games that they were creating together to these rock star game designers who were flown in from Austin, from you know, the Bay Area, from New York, and they really were like rock stars. They showed up at night with sunglasses on, the kids were like, oh my God, another one, you know, all throughout the week. And it was spectacular. The kids, their fear was palpable. So it was a real opportunity to, to measure over the course of the week. And so we talk about measurement, standardized tests fill this measurement gap that we need to measure the progress. Well, watching kids for a week as they learn an entirely new skill is also very measurable, it turns out. They had to create games that had social value. They couldn't just create any old game they wanted. And so Louisiana likes to joke that if not for Mississippi, they'd be dead last in every single category that matters, healthcare, um, education. So they were starting from scratch. Um, they were working on obesity, uh, police brutality, unemployment, and they had to do real research together, and they had to find roles within the team. And this is a really critical part of collaboration, and I am a huge believer in the fact that if, I, if adults want to learn how to work in collaborative groups, 
they need to start spending more time watching kids. These kids naturally fell into their roles over the course of the week, and one of them became the, you know, the art director, and one of them was the lead researcher and the producer, and they worked together on their, on their issues, and when, when the end of the week rolled around, and they had to do their presentations to these game designers, these game designers really taught them what it feels like to be an entrepreneur and to get up and to pitch an idea to a potential funder. Okay, they grilled these kids mercilessly, and it was fantastic to see kids getting grilled mercilessly because we treat kids like they're made out of glass and that they can't possibly withstand the slightest bit of pressure. Um, and that's really damaging to them, I believe. So these kids were terrified. They got up in their suits. They came up there, and they had their slides, and they rocked it. They absolutely rocked it. One kid was asked, he had a, an environmental game uh, that had a, a component called whack a nutria. And I don't know how many of you have seen the pleasure of, of, of a nutria, but they are giant river rats that you, that you find in the Gulf Coast. So the game designer said, how do you know that the whack-a-mole people aren't going to come after you for copyright violation for your whack a nutria? And that kid did not blink. He laid out a six-point argument Okay, for why he knew he was not in copyright violation of whack-a-mole. And later, a girl did the same thing when she used Beethoven music in her game. She explained how copyright law works. These kids blew our minds, okay? They are the future. As we continued to work on this project, um, we realized, we, we worked on it for a couple of years, and we started to look for some, the next place that we would take the Imagination Age. The Imagination Age was never just meant to be a philosophical framework. It's meant to be a code of action for actually creating the future that these kids will inhabit and allow them to teach us as adults how we should be acting professionally and, and socially. So in the course of this project, uh, we, we met two individuals. One is uh, Bob Lindberg, who's the founding director of NASA Langley's Think Tank. He is himself a scientist and an engineer. So we talk a lot about STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. STEM is missing an A. I like to call it STEAM, arts. Art is a huge part of how we express science. Uh, scientists are often so focused on their ideas that they don't stop and think how they can express it to anyone outside their own heads, much less outside their own labs. And so we have this huge uh, chasm between the important scientific work that's being done and the ability for the public to understand the value of it. I believe that's a design gap that artists and designers can collaborate with scientists to fill. Um, and the other problem is that engineering is not taught in school. Kids know nothing about engineering, whereas their teachers have been trained in the scientific method. They have not been trained in the engineering design process. And so kids are very familiar with uh, the scientific method and not familiar at all with the engineering design process. And so I saw a talk that Bob Lindbergh gave where he has these two black boxes and one of them has the scientific method and one of them has the engineering design process and he explains science is everything in the natural world. There is an answer in science, whereas in engineering there are many possible solutions and it's market driven by need so that you can determine which one you're going to go with. But when he was explaining this, he looked over at a tree next to him in the room and he said, well, for example, that's a, a tree, it's part of the natural world. And then he looked at it again and he said, maybe it's a fake tree. And, and in that moment, maybe it's a fake tree, maybe it's a real tree, you see that there's sort of a sliding scale between the way we're living now as we become more and more enmeshed with technology. We started collaborating with him. And we also met, I was asked to give a talk at a place called Science House in New York. I had never heard of Science House, and I was thrilled to go and talk about creativity. It was the first talk that they had ever had about creativity and the imagination age. And I basically went, and I never came back. I'm working there now. I'm the executive vice president for business development at Science House. And I believe that Science House is the the model uh, that the future needs to sort of unfold along the lines of. So um, Josh, who's my collaborator, is now running the foundation at Science House, uh, sparking the imaginations of kids all over the world 
for science. And then we support them in our network, uh, not just financially with the different projects they're working on, but through different programs that we have. And one of them is called Micro Global Scope, which I love because they're digital microscopes and the kids take pictures of whatever's around them and they can see it on their computer screens, enlarged, uh, whatever it is, butterfly wings, coins, the fabric of your jeans, anything. But it gives an entirely new perspective on the world and it creates a scientific, creative backdrop against which these kids are actually turning themselves into global collaborators. Because right now, we're still very much in the industrial era model of thought when it comes to culture and evolution of culture, which is that all of the cultures of the world, by necessity, sprung up in relative isolation from one another. And we are now dealing with the aftermath of these cultures learning how to interact. And we're faced with the idea that we may have to design systems that put us in a position of mild absolutism, that we have to say something is better than the way you're doing it now, or are our Western values going to come and engulf your values here and there? I, I believe that we have an obligation to the future if, in fact, we are creating a future in which imagination is the most important characteristic leading us into the intelligence era, which will be marked marked by the relationship between humans and machines that are smarter than humans. We have an obligation to at least try and understand now what that relationship is going to look like because the rapid transformation of technology is putting us in a position where we can't possibly keep track of everything as it changes. So we as adults need kids to help us understand how this is working because they have a natural fluidity. Kids, for example, love robots, okay? They love robots, but what is a robot? We as adults still think, I am a human, I am a robot. That's not how it's going to be. There's going to be, again, a, a gradual slide into a situation in which children, uh, you know, embody this world. And so as part of our work, uh, we do Skype consultation with kids. If they have questions, we'll answer them. We, you know, pop in the classroom and we don't have to travel. And so we have this uh, group of kids that we do, you know, robot ethics consultations with. But basically it just amounts to them asking us yes or no questions from iRobot, Isaac Asimov's book, and, about, and questions about the three laws of robotics. You know, do we believe that robots should be allowed to do things that humans traditionally do, yes or no? Do we believe, you know, and so on. So the first year we did it, we just answered their questions and kind of just hung back to see what kind of questions they were gonna ask. But last year, right before the Skype call, the Navy announced it's working on a, a robot that's capable of deception. Well, that kind of changes everything. So kids still think of robots in a way, they don't realize that how many drones we have fighting wars in Afghanistan. They don't understand that we're already designing robots uh, that can do things that humans traditionally have done. I would recommend, if you're interested in this, checking out the series that Slate is doing on robots uh, taking our jobs. My suggestion um, and, uh, about the future and designing the future is just let kids teach us how to stay in touch with our imaginations. I believe that the creative adult is the child that has survived. That's an Ursula K. Le Guin quote, and we owe it to the future if, in fact, we are to evolve quickly enough to save ourselves from the meta threat of climate change and other threats that we face as, as a collective uh, group on Earth. We really need to let children design their own future and stop standing in their way.